Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for the opportunity we have together. Let's pray now that you will uh, bless the service, that you will uh, be lifted up because we are here, that we will do our best to honor, to love you, to adore you this morning. Father, we give you this service. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Lord in church, please stand.
sits on heaven's mercy seas.
You're a pretty big part of his wonderful name. For you he was born, that's why he came. And he gave his love for you as the reason he died. It even takes you to spell crucified. Isn't it thrilling and splendidly grand? He rose from the dead with you in his plan. The stone split away and the full trumpet blew, and this word resurrection is spelled with a U. When Jesus left the earth in his upward ascension, he felt there was one thing he just had to mention. Go into the world and tell them it's true, that I love them all just like I love you. So many great people are spelled with a U, but they have the right to know Jesus too. It all depends on how what you will do. We'd like them to know, but it all starts with you. When Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking of you, spelled Y-O-U.
the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you give us so much, Lord. We just ask that you help us to give this amount back so that we can spread your kingdom throughout the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Read as follows. So he came into a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the, as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and we have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You are right. When you say that you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands and the man you are now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Um, the woman was coming to the well to get what? Water. What kind of water? Drinking water. She was coming to the well because she was thirsty. And Jesus begins speaking to her and talking to her about thirst. How many of you are thirsty? It's too bad. See, I was going to put a bottle of water on every seat this morning. Kind of get you under the mood that we're thirsty. But I didn't do that. I should have done that. Some of you are thirsty. And we want to quench that thirst so that you can have your thirst quenched. That's what Jesus is saying here. Quench your thirst so that you can then have your true thirst quenched. What was he talking about? What's her true thirst? The thirst for God. The thirst for Christ. The thirst for, she even said, the Messiah is coming. We know he's coming and he'll explain all of this. Not realizing that she was standing in front of who? The Messiah. You know? But he's saying to her, you can come and draw water and quench their thirst, but they will thirst again. But, if you will drink what I will give you, you will never thirst again. Okay? He's explaining something to you, and then here's what we need to realize today. We have a physical thirst. I mean, I don't know about you, but I am constantly drinking. I mean, I have a cup back there. I just took a drink before I came up. Um, constantly drinking. My throat gets dry. But just constantly. I, I have this need to drink. Um, when I have bottled waters in the house, I probably drink 10 or 12 a day. I mean, I just drink. It's just something I do. It seems like every time I drink, I still have this thirst. Can't seem to quench it. Well, see, we also have a spiritual thirst. We're, we're born with it. We have a thirst for something. And a lot of people spend their entire life looking for that something, don't they? 
Jesus told this woman, if you drink of what I give you, you'll never thirst again. And she's like, well, then give it to me. Because she didn't want to have to what? I don't want to have to come back to the well all the time for thirst. She didn't quite get what he was meaning. That she will never thirst again. But we understand from the story, we can see that if we thirst, if we drink Christ, we never thirst again. What does he mean? How do we not thirst again? <clears throat> See, because as I read my Bible, as I read through, as I take out the scriptures that talk about thirst, it says, man who thirsts after righteousness. How do you thirst after righteousness? A man who thirsts after Christ. A man who will allow God to quench his thirst. I mean, there's all these different verses talking about it. How does that happen? How do we quench that thirst? We talk about it week after week after week. How do we quench the thirst for Christ? We read His Word. We drink in His Word. Now, if I'm at the house and I'm thirsty, I'm going to go to the tap, or I'm going to go to the refrigerator and I'm going to get something to drink because I'm thirsty. When my soul, when my spirit is thirsty, where do I go? It says God. Some say to the Word. We can go to one of two places when we're thirsty. When we're spiritually thirsty, one of two places. One, to the Word of God. We can pick up His Word and we can read and we can try to quench that thirst. We can take in more of God to fill our cup, the Scripture says. What's the second place we can go to fill our, our quench our thirst? Prayer. We can actually go physically to God's feet, to His throne, and we can pray and we can discuss and we can talk and we can have that relationship with Him that fills our thirst. That's the only two ways there is of quenching the thirst of the Spirit. Both of them require going to God. Going to His Word or going directly to Him in prayer. The only way to quench your thirst in Christ and God is to go to them and take it in. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that I see that are spiritually thirsty. And they think that coming here on Sunday morning will quench that thirst. They think there's no other time that they need to get drink of God other than Sunday morning. I talked to people and said, well, you know, you're asking me to come Wednesday, and you're telling me about Sunday school, and you're talking about the ladies' Bible study group, and you're telling me about these different things and men's fellowship yesterday and Saturday. You're talking about all these things, but I was there Sunday. Okay. Good start. How many of you eat at least one meal every day? How many of you eat more than one meal a day? How many of you eat three meals and snack all day? <laughs> Why? Why do you eat? Hungry. Because huh? we're Christians. Christians eat. <laughs> We haven't ate together in a long time either. Um, but you have to look at it. Every day I get up, I get the kids ready, get them fed, get them out the door. And one of the first things I do is like, okay, now me. Me what? Cereal, sandwich, Pop-Tart, egg, something to eat. Because my body needs to eat. In order to maintain this, you eat. Sometimes we eat once or twice a day. Sometimes we eat a whole lot more because we want more to maintain. And you have to look at it that way. In order to maintain this, I eat. Inside this, there is a spiritual being. And in order to maintain that spiritual be being, I have to what? Eat. I have to feed them. Okay, well, 
yesterday was eggs and sausage and pancakes with um, orange juice and chocolate milk. That was breakfast. That was breakfast here. Men's group eats very well. You missed it. You really missed it. Um, how oh, forget hash browns? I had a little bit of those. Just a little bit because I had more sausage. But but we we eat very well. And then uh, for lunch it was a ham salad sandwich. And then for dinner it was um, spaghetti. And I know that in the afternoon I was watching a basketball game and it was um, almonds and uh, water. And then when I was out taking Camille to her girlfriends and taking Jacob to work, I stopped and I got these two bags of chips. And I know that last night, while watching some more ball game and, and some shows, um, it was chips and a soda. I can tell you what I ate yesterday. I can tell you what parts of it were good, and I can tell you what parts of it weren't so good. But I can tell you what I ate. And I know that in between there was several bottles of water and, and, and other things that I had to drink, and it was all good. Yesterday I had um, prayer in the morning. Then I had a Bible study here with the men. I had a little bit of time in the afternoon working on my sermon and just going over what we're going to say today. Um, I had a special prayer from a friend who called and said they needed prayer for the evening. And I had some prayer time at, at night when I went to bed. That was my spiritual feeding yesterday. Now, what did I do more of yesterday? Physical feeding or spiritual feeding? Physical. And I'll point that out to you because I want you to, I want you to realize this, that you're probably a lot like me or maybe less. I would hope that you did more spiritual feeding than physical feeding than I did yesterday, but statistics tell me you did See, statistics tell me that the average Christian, how many of you believe you're average Christian? How many believe you're below average? How many think you're above average? Think pretty highly of yourselves. Um, the average Christian spends seven minutes a day in prayer and spiritual feeding. Average Christian. That means for those of you that did 10 minutes, there are some in this room that did four. For some of you that did 14 minutes, there are people in this room who did none. And you know, you know where you're at. You understand where you're at. Your spirit, spirit thirsts for God. Just as my physical body thirsts for water and drink, just as my physical body is hungry, my spiritual body is the same. And if I'm going to take care of my physical body, how much more should I take care of my spiritual body? Because see this that's in front of you? One day, the worms will crawl in and the worms will crawl out. The worms will play peanut butter in my snap. <laughs> you, know that, you know that song? One day this is going to be six feet under or burned up or something. It's temporary. And look how I take care of it. And my spirit is eternal. My spirit will be there from this point through eons. How much should I take care of it? See, the woman came to the well looking for water because she thirsted, looking for water because maybe she wanted to cook, looking for water to give to other people, as she stated. But, what did she get? 
she got God. She ran into Jesus who, did he condemn her? No. Did he point out her errors and her ways? Yes. And then he what? Finish the story. He what? Sent her back on her way. To do what? Sin. Sin. No more. I don't know about you, but as I read the scriptures, as I study through, as I look through, and as I was looking at first, is it a sin not to spiritually feed your body? Is it a sin to know what God wants and what He desires and to not do it? So do we sin when we don't feed our physical bodies? I think so. I mean, you have to look at it. We've been given something to take care of. We've been given something that is there for us. Physically, we do try to take care of it. But really... Look in the mirror. Don't do this in public. <laughs> Get naked and stand in front of a mirror. <laughs> How many of you are happy with what you see? There's a reason why we don't have full length mirrors in our house. <laughs> do we have any mirrors in our house? <laughs> How many of you, how many of you could stand in front of a falling mirror and say, awesome? <laughs> how many of you find fault? You know why we find fault? How many of you are perfect to take care of this? Yeah. And I want to tell you that if you're not perfect to take taking care of this, I'll guarantee you're probably not perfect taking care of the spiritual side either. And if we could stand in front of the mirror and just see our spiritual being, how much worse shape or better shape would it be in? Can you imagine having a full-length mirror in the house that showed your spiritual being? What would it look like? What would it be like? See, there's a lot of different places the Bible talks about thirst. And it's thirsting for what? God. In every instance you read thirst in the Bible, it's thirsting for God. Now I'm going to tell you one. Jesus was hanging on the cross and He said these words, I thirst. Now the guards thought He was thirsty hanging on the cross in the sun during the day, and they brought him a sponge of vinegar and let him taste it. Nice of them. Because if you're thirsty, you don't want vinegar, do you? You want something that's going to quench that thirst. But a lot of your scholars believe that when he was on the cross and he said, I thirst, that he thirsted for what? God. He thirsted for what he knew. And what did Jesus do? He knew what He wanted. He knew that He wanted back that relationship with His Father. He thirsted for Dad. He thirsted for the same things we thirst for. Now, you have a spiritual thirst. What is that spiritual thirst for? You know? How many of you spiritually thirst to be loved? Four of you thirst for love. <laughs> so the rest of you don't care. Why are you with her? Why are you with him? Why are we with somebody? Why do we do this? Valentine's is tomorrow. We can talk about love. Why? Because we need to be what? Love. 
we have this need to be accepted. What about your spiritual side? Does it have a need to be loved? See, we have this need to be loved. Someone, someone put on, on a website yesterday that a song that one of the Gabor sisters was singing, and it was all about love and a perfect kind of love, and, and she made this statement. Her quote was, I love him, and he loves me, and that will be for an eternity. And she was talking about a man on this earth. Now, you know what's so funny about the Gabor sisters singing that song? <laughs> Between them, 18 divorces. <laughs> I love him and he loves me and that's for an eternity. Maybe. <laughs> Who do you get unconditional love from? God. I mean, you like to think the unconditional love comes from your spouse, or the, but there's always seems to be something there, right? So we, we look for love and we get that kind of love only from God. What about um, purpose? We talked in sermon in the past on purpose. How many of you long for a purpose? Something to do with a direction of Where can we get that perfect purpose? God. Our spiritual side can give us everything we're looking for in this life if we hunger and thirst after God. And that doesn't mean that we snack here and there. That this is our main meal for the week. And then maybe I'll have some chips tomorrow, God, and maybe... Uh, Wednesday, I'll be some pie of God. Amen. When Scripture says that we hunger and thirst after God, or hunger and thirst after righteousness, what does it mean? We go after it. I mean, I, I guarantee you, if you sat here to the point that you were hungry, when you're hungry, you would go after a meal. I guarantee you that most of you are going to leave here today and go after a meal. <laughs> and when Scripture talks about hungry and thirsting after God, hungry and thirsting after righteousness, hungry and thirsting for Christ, it means to go get it. That hunger that drives you, that thirst that drives you to, to quench it. I mean, I told you, I know how I am. If I get thirsty, I will get something to drink. Do I do that with my spirit? Do I drink in Christ when I, my spirit desires it? Or do I put them on? Do I give him his seven minutes a day? That'd be a good experiment this week, wouldn't it? This week, this week, physically, you only have seven minutes a day to eat. <laughs> That's it. Seven minutes. How much would you eat in seven minutes? The prisoner. The prisoner in jail who gets one last meal. order whatever they want. This is going to be it. This is your last meal. How do they eat it? Very slowly. Sure. Why? Why do they eat it slowly? To savor it. They want to savor that taste, that flavor. I mean, this is it. I'm not going to get anymore. What's normally going to happen to that person that's savoring that meal? They're going to die. They understand that. They know that this is it. When I'm done with this meal, it's time. Do you know how long, do you know how long the prison system gives people for their last meal? Two 
two hours. Two hours for last meal. If your if your execution time is midnight, they're going to bring your last meal about ten o'clock. And they say this that it's hard for most prisoners to eat it. They eat it slow and they savor it, but they, they, it's hard for them to eat it because they know that when it's done, <coughs> they're done. And so they slowly eat it and do this. Now, we're all on a time clock. We're all on, on a time that we don't know. Scripture tells us no man knows the day nor the hour. If I hunger and thirst after righteousness, I better eat it in now because I may not be given a what? A tomorrow. I mean, it's 11 o'clock. It's about lunchtime. I'm going to go from here and I'm going to eat lunch. And how shall I eat that lunch? Well, if Christ decides He's coming back at noon, if I want to eat it all, I better gobble it in. But if I think he's going to tarry, I can take my time and save the food and eat it slow and then do what I want to do. You see, but because we don't know when Christ will return, because we have this hunger and thirst after God, we have to do what we can do now to feel that hunger and thirst. Because we're not promised of tomorrow. And we're not promised the next hour. And if we're going to be filled to overflowing, as Scripture tells us, God wants to give you a life and a life more abundant. I mean, read all the different stuff that He wants to give you. Read the Scriptures about thirsting and see what's around them. Around all of them, He is going to give you something of it. Here with the lady, He's going to give her drink that what? She'll never thirst again. Now, how do we get to the point that we'll never thirst for God again? Everything else I read is that we will hunger and thirst after righteousness. We'll hunger and thirst. We'll thirst. We'll want. We'll want. And as you get more, you want more, right? So at what point do we get that we will never thirst again? Where? We get to heaven. So in this life, we're going to hunger and thirst. We're going to learn that through the Scripture. We're, we are going to hunger and thirst after God. And what we do to feel that is up to us. And I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand this. I think a lot of you spiritually are starving. I think a lot of you spiritually are dehydrated. I think a lot of you spiritually are one step from death. And what is death spiritually? Separation from God. Hell. And we've got to be able to see that. We have to be able to recognize that. That it is up to me. It's not up to my church. They do what they can do through Sunday school, through church, through youth groups, through, through worship on Sunday mornings, and different things they offer to help us spiritually be fed. But in those off times, in those times of world, it is our job, it is our responsibility to feed this soul. And if it's in starving condition, if it's in a dehydrated condition, that's our fault. No one else's. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your kid's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your aunt and uncle's fault. It, it's my fault. If I can read my scriptures and see what God wants from me and I do nothing about it, that's my fault. That is my sin, not theirs. I stand before you today and I tell you that I look pretty healthy. I may be too healthy physically. But how do I look spiritually? That's hard for you to see. 
Well, you, you can see me stand up here on Sunday mornings and be your minister and speak these words of God and look at this stuff and think, man, he's got it together. But what about the rest of the week? What about those hours and times you don't see me? What's going on? What's happening? What's, what's being done? And the same with you. I, I can sit here Sunday morning and see you and think, man, look at, look at them. There are ten of it. They seem to have got it. And when I ask questions, they've got the answers. Do you really? Do we really? Is my spiritual body fed enough that it can't fit in my physical body? Am I so full of Christ and God that my cup overfloweth, as Scripture says? From my abundance, others learn and see? Or do I have to dig deep and give you something that's just left? Do you hunger and thirst for God? Do you have this craving that's on you that you can't get enough of? Do you do everything in your power to feed that spirit in you every chance you get? In Sunday school today, Bill Perger asked, he said, that we're talking about having to give up things. Sometimes in, with the Spirit, sometimes it says you have to give up in order to receive. You have to get rid of some things in your life to make God room for God. And Bill says, well, does that mean that maybe we should get rid of the TV? Should we have a TV? Should we have that kind of stuff? And we start talking about, well, you know, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think a TV is a bad thing. I don't know if you need the one-inch black screen hanging on the wall, the whole fancy stuff like that. But it's what you do with that TV. Does that TV take up time that could be God's? It would be interesting if you would log every hour of your day. Spent so much time eating, spent so much time reading, spent so much time watching TV, spent so much time in the car right here, so so much. Log it all out and see. Where's your time band? Where's that thing that's taking time that you could probably sacrifice so that you could quench the thirst the spirit has? See, because a lot of times we'll, we'll forego spiritual feeding for, well, I've got this to do. How important is that? How important was that basketball game that you spent two hours and 20 minutes in front of the TV to watch that when it's over, it's over. What significance did it make in my life? I know who won. I know who lost. Beyond that, what? And, and I could watch Sports Center and see who won and lost. I can see all the highlights, see the best plays of the game. Except so seeing all that girl stuff in the middle. <laughs> I watched the basketball game yesterday. That in six minutes, in six minutes in a basketball game, two points were scored. Now, if you understand something, six minutes of basketball game is a long time. I mean, six minutes of basketball game took about 15 minutes. Of time. In six minutes of that basketball game, they had two commercial timeouts for the TV network. One of the teams called a timeout because they couldn't do a thing. And try to figure it all out. I didn't have to watch that. I did. <laughs> and afterwards, I'm sitting there going, no, that was wow. I could have, yeah. There are so many other things I could have done, but there are lots. And, and you got to think of those things because we hunger and thirst after things in life, and we hunger and thirst after Christ. And if we're busy doing those mundane things, something's not getting fed. Something's not getting done. Something more could have been accomplished if 
And we've got to find out what those ifs are in our life, and we have to weed those out. The woman at the well, what was her thing? What was her time band? Men. It's evident. She was searching for something, and she's searching, and, and she five, five men that she's divorced from or whatever from, and living with one now, searching for when Jesus tells her the answer you're looking for is what? Living water. What is living water? Christ. And even she recognized that because she says someday the Messiah is going to come and help explain all this. No, he's standing right here. And he didn't condemn you. He told you simply to go and sin no more. He gave you the living water you were looking for if you would but drink. How many of you drink the living water? How many of you thirst? So did you really drink the living water? That's a, that's a confusing story, isn't it? If you drink the living water, you'll thirst no more, and yet we thirst after Christ continually. Just get more and more. There it is. What do we learn from that story on Thursday? What do we learn from that whole thing? What is it the point he's trying to make? Only Christ can fill our needs. And so we search in this life for what? Christ and Christ alone. He'll fill our need for love. He'll fill our need for purpose. He'll fill our need in, in all the different ways there is in life. The key word in this scripture you think is the word, and we've said it all day, thirst. But the real key of this scripture is the word quench. We all thirst. But how do you quench your thirst? Hopefully sitting here, it's Christ. We quench our thirst by drinking and pouring in Christ. The answer to everything he's saying here is Christ. She even saw the answer when the Messiah comes to explain it. He's explaining it. It's Christ. Christ alone. And we spend so much of our lives trying to fill in with everything else. Trying to fill in with needs. I mean, look at people who don't have Jesus. Look at people who, that you know, that you're friends with, that are around your place. What do they do? How do they feel their thirst? Look at them. Drinking. Drinking. Carousing. Clubbing. New car. New boat. New wife. New husband. New. Looking for but never finding, because the only answer is Christ. And until they see Christ, they are going to thirst after whatever the world will give them. We get Christ, we thirst after Christ. And Christ alone. And He is the only one that can fill our thirst. Do you thirst after Christ today? If you're sitting here today and you've never given your life to Christ, maybe this is the time that you feel that thirst that you say, God, I want to get rid of that thirst in myself. I want to quit searching this world for the answer and I want to search Christ for the answer. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've already given your life to Christ and you're still thirsting and you're thinking, why do I still thirst? Because you're looking in all the wrong places to feel that thirst. Christ is the only answer. And you have got to feel that thirst yourselves. This is this is a big cup of cold water today. 
But once that cup of cold water is gone today, then what? You'll thirst. And you need to be able to pick up that cup, fill it back up with water, and drink it. And not just any water, living water. The water that will quench that thirsty, Christ. So if you're here today and you have not accepted Christ in your life, maybe today's the day you do that. If you're here and you've accepted Christ in your life, maybe today is the day you really get serious about it and say, you know what? I gave him part of my life today, I need to give up. I gave I, I gave my whole life the day that I was I accepted him, was baptized, but I've taken part of the fact. Maybe today you have to give it back. So he can feel that thirst. So the scripture says to overflow, to an abundance. To, to, to more than your vessel can hold so that others can drink from it. So that when people see you, they're not drinking of you, they're drinking of Christ. I mean, look what Scripture talks about. It. Do you have Christ in your life? Do you use Him to quench your thirst? If you need Christ, if you need to have your thirst quenched, then you need Christ. Make your decisions today as we stand in the decision. We're going to do this one a cappella, so feel free to harmonize and raise your voices up. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old Fill ourselves with you that we can serve you and, and show people you in all ways. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
do that to you this morning also? You take the arm around him and you pat him in the back? Oh, yeah. That's cool. Just land in there. Thank you. 